Hi, this is Pastor Kevin with Journey of Faith Forest Christian Church. I just wanted to take a moment and thank you for logging on today to watch our video podcast as we explore God's Word and apply it to our lives. You know, it's so important for our walks so that we spend time each day in God's Word to get to know Him and get to grow in Him. With all of my teachings, I have a sermon handout that is used during the message. It contains scriptures and fill-in-the-blank sections for you to follow along with. You may obtain this handout by logging on to our website that is listed on the screen. Go to our resources section and choose study materials. I hope and pray that God's word will speak to you today and thank you for joining the journey. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go on to the house of the Lord. you remember that? Let us go on to the house of the Lord. Amen. I'm, I'm so glad. That's one of my, uh, my favorite thing in the world, I think, is to be in church. I asked my grandson, who has never heard me preach, my eight-year-old, and I, I asked him, what do you think my favorite thing in the whole world is to do? And without hesitation, just like that, he said, preach. <laughs> oh, okay. I was thinking to be in church, you know, in worship, but I guess uh, he sees me. You know, I prepare a sermon every day. I really do, every day. Why, every day. It's uh, hard for me to, uh, to just read scripture without stopping and, and thinking of illustrations and uh, preaching. Every day I preach to thousands. Uh, you can't see them, but I, I preach to them. <laughs> Come and let us go unto the house of the Lord, to the mountain of the Lord, unto the city of our God. And He will show us His ways, and we will walk in His paths. Come and let us go unto the mountain of the Lord, unto the city of our God. When it talks about uh, Mount, like there in Micah chapter 2, or uh, uh, Psalm 48, uh, when it talks about the mountain, the mountain of the Lord, the city of our God, it's talking about the presence of God. That, that's a, a Jewish expression of saying the presence of God. I was really upset when uh, one of those um, Superman movies came out years ago, and the whole premise of the movie was that they needed to get to this place uh, where the source of his power was, and what did they call it? North. North. Read Psalm 48, and he's in the mountain of the Lord on the north side. The north, the north. It's another expression of saying the presence, the power of God, the source of all strength. That's, that's the way it says. Man, I'm getting a lot of ring back. Is, um, are you guys? Is it okay? Oh, all right. All right. Um, anyway, I, I want to uh, continue with the service from uh, last Saturday. Last Saturday, I, I spoke at, at night with the, with the kids. And when I finished, I was going to make an altar call. And Ms. Janine says, no, 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 they need to take a break. I said, why? I said, you've been speaking for two hours. And, oh, okay. So they took a break. Without breaking the spirit, they came back, and for another two and a half hours, they worshipped the Lord. We didn't have singers and musicians, I mean, there was some recorded music, but it was just the power and the glory of God transforming lives and, and, and making himself manifest, making himself known and felt uh, among his people. <clears throat> I think it's uh, Jeremiah who said, You shall seek me, and you shall find me. When? When you shall seek me with all of your heart. God is not lost. The Holy Spirit is not lost. I was thinking this morning, uh, it threw me a curve, because uh, I, I was thinking, speaking a certain way this morning, and, and then when I heard the news from Baton Rouge, you know, I was there for almost two weeks in March at a... Uh, at a, at a uh, Holy Ghost convention. <laughs> and and uh, every day, 
the place was crawling the cups. They come, they take their break, and they, 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 they listen to the worship, and some of them speak in tongues and out in the lobby, and you can see they look at their, at their at the time. So they take their breaks and then they leave. Or they take their lunch there, you can see them, you know, sometimes they're still chewing on something, and they come in for a while, then they leave. And after every service, of course, the, the, the police department um, comes and they help with direct traffic because it empties out into the main, the main street, the one that, uh, that was closed this morning because of the shooting. So a lot of those police officers attend uh, spirit-filled and Holy Ghost type the church. A lot of them do. And, and uh, undoubtedly, all of them have had uh, occasion to be touched by, by the Pentecostals. That, uh, that group is calling the people, good people that love the Lord. So, we keep that in mind. Um, <clears throat> so, let me begin. As a four-square church, and part of the larger Pentecostal uh, movement, we believe in four things, right? The four basic doctrines that we believe. And we need to know this. We don't just attend it. We're part of a, of a very particular uh, movement, a move of God that is different from the rest of the church. I mean the church at large. Because the church at large, it hasn't grown in the last 15 years. It has diminished. The cults have grown but not the Christian church, except for the Pentecostal, the Spirit-filled church. And most of that is overseas. Just a little bit of it is here in the United States. <clears throat> I was thinking, why is that? It's because the great churches, like the, uh, the Methodists that were so anointed, preached so powerfully, wrote all the gospel hymns that, that, uh, that we sang for years, evangelized the United States uh, along with the Baptists and you know, all the major denominations that, that were spirit-filled and they preached salvation and preached with power and they are the ones that built this country. God blesses a nation when the people recognize God and serve God. God takes his spirit away from a nation when the people of God get cold. And so as those denominations have gotten cold, we see the deterioration of, of, of this country. So we believe in salvation, we believe in praying for the sick, we believe in healing, and we believe in the second return of Christ, the two-part return of Christ, which is the rapture of the church, and then when Christ comes again, and every eye will see him, and he will judge the nations. But the fourth thing that we believe is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that, you may ask, well, what, what is that? The baptism of the Holy Spirit is available to those people who have received Christ as their Savior, to believers. It is a second experience after salvation. You get saved, and then you, and the Spirit of God draws you, and we are baptized by the Spirit into the body of Jesus Christ. We become the church. We become the, the body of Christ. That's Sometimes that's called baptism. But there is a second experience, and that is where the power of God, the infilling of the Holy Spirit comes and gives you this other experience that, 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 um, that separates the men from the boys, as it were. It gives you power. And sometimes uh, people say, uh, Pastor Ruben, you, you're kind of noisy, you know, you're kind of loud, and, and uh, you find out your music is real loud and crazy. Well, let me tell you, I come from a noisy crew. I come from a long descendants, and my DNA goes all the way back 2,000 years ago to Jerusalem, to an upper room where 120 of my forefathers in Christ sat there just waiting, not knowing what was going to happen. They were saved. They were believers. That's why they were there. They were scared. They were being persecuted. They were being hunted down. But they got together in a group, regardless of that, and waited, not knowing what was going to happen. And what happened was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The power of God came down, 
and gave them a second experience other than accepting Christ, and something happened to them. And what happened to them was not, was, was, uh, um, what was, it wasn't really new because it had been prophesied. So the people came around, I mean, they were so noisy, you think I'm noisy. The whole town gathered around, they all, everybody came, they came running. What was all of this noise and this tumult and this, uh, this big thing? And they thought, oh, these people, oh my goodness, they've been drinking all night, they're all drunk. Peter stands up in Acts chapter 2. You should take notes uh, or try to keep up. One or the other. Uh, uh, anyway, I'm not going to stop. Uh, Acts chapter 2 verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let, let this be known to you and heed my words. Listen up. That's what he's saying. Listen up. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, like you're accusing them of, since it is only the third hour of the day, nine o'clock in the morning. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days. Now, the last days, uh, church, began on the day that Jesus Christ ascended into heaven. And the last days, that period of time called in the Bible, the last days, starts when Jesus ascended into heaven and ends when the church is raptured. That we're living in the last days. And according to Matthew 24, and according to Daniel, where knowledge and, and, uh, would be multiplied and, and time would speed up, that that last days are coming to a close. Because it's getting faster and faster, closer and closer. And since, since the last days began, more or less on the day of Pentecost, Peter said, this is going to happen starting now in the last days. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters, that is your young people, shall prophesy. What does that mean? They'll speak the things of God. Young men shall see visions. They'll get, a, they'll get ambition for the things of God. Your old men shall dream dreams. It doesn't mean we sit in church and fall asleep. It means that, 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 that we, 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 we dream, we think of, and we desire the things of God. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, the working age people, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. It doesn't say just the apostles, just the pastors, just the ministers. It says everybody. The youth group, the, old, the, the, the older people. I was going to say old, but I, I, I can't say that anymore because it you know, comes close, too close to home. And, and, and the working age people. Upon everybody. And in all of those people will prophesy. Everyone will speak the things of God. Now, you can speak the things of God. But we have Bible studies coming out of our ears. There's a difference between having a Bible study and having a Bible study. Where the power of God is manifest and the Word comes alive and things happen. I don't know about you. I'm, I'm, I get a little bored and tired of so many Bible studies. I mean, there's, there's books on this and books on that. There's teaching on this, teaching on that. And, but it doesn't do much. What do you mean it doesn't do much? I feel great when I, when I go to Bible study. We feel great, but nobody's getting saved. That's the difference. When the power of God is there, people start getting saved. I'll show you. In Acts chapter 8, we have four occasions in the book of Acts where the Holy Spirit came and baptized people after they were saved. After they were believers. Philip, who was just a deacon in the church, and I, I, I would love to have visited uh, Philip's home at that time. He, he was the ordinary guy that he was chosen to be one of the ushers. He was a deacon. He was a worker in the church. But he was filled with the Spirit of God. Not only him, you, 
You know what? I would like to have been there. Can you imagine what dinner was like at Philip's house? This man that was anointed, who was teletransported into another place? <laughs> That's quite an experience. Who was so powerful when he spoke, people got saved. But he had four daughters. Can you imagine four girls? As it is, they don't stop talking. Can you imagine when they're filled with the Spirit, they all prophesy. Can you imagine what dinner was like at their house? <laughs> oh, man, I, just, I, I, I was just reading today about this, and I was just saying, oh, you should have seen today when I went over to Macy's, the Spirit of God came on me, and I started prophesying, and people started lining up in the, in the cosmetic aisle just to receive Christ. You know, that, it, kind of like that. I, I can just imagine what his house must have been like. Poor mom. You know? And then they were always bringing strangers in and people getting saved and come on over here so I can pray with them and bring, drag people in so they can pray for them. And, uh, you know. Can you imagine? I've experienced homes like that. It is glorious. It's like a touch of heaven. You say, those people aren't real. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. People are real. And uh, even when we're not, God is real. God is real. The Spirit of God is real. That's when you know that there is revival when it comes to your home. It came to Philip's home. Anyway, so he, he went to Samaria. The Lord took him to Samaria. He preached, and all of these uh, Gentiles got saved. And so the, the, the apostles back in Jerusalem, back at headquarters, thought, uh, not sure that's the right thing to do. I thought only the Jews were supposed to get saved. So they sent Peter and John, the two top apostles, to go down to Samaria and check it out. And of course, Peter, where he went, he started preaching and uh, found out that they were saved. But then, now, in Acts chapter 8, verse 14, now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They weren't baptized into the Holy Spirit. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. That is, they were saved. They believed in Jesus Christ. Then they, the apostles, laid hands on them. And what happened? They received the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit comes for that second filling for that infilling to come and dwell inside of us after we're saved. And oftentimes, the pattern at the beginning was when, when the leaders of the church laid hands on them, they would receive the Holy Spirit. So, so you have the 120, you have Philip down in Samaria with these people, and then the, number three, you have Paul in Acts chapter 9, uh, you remember the story of Paul when he was on the road to Damascus. Uh, the Lord appeared to him, knocked him off his donkey, it, it blinded him with the light, and, and immediately he, he got saved. He said, Lord, call the Lord. What would you have me do? And he, he just he surrendered to Christ. But he was blind. And so they, they, they took him to, uh, to this house. And the Lord spoke to another brother, just an ordinary person in the church. I want you to go and pray for uh, Paul. Now, the first thing that, that Ananias was supposed to pray for was for the kind of ministry that Paul was going to receive. I don't know how many times, if you've ever noticed the calling that he had. We know he was an apostle, and we know he, he, he evangelized the world, we know that he wrote all these what is it, 14 books of the, of the New Testament, and all of those things. But you know what his real ministry was? To suffer. He was called to the ministry of suffering. Wow. And he was willing. He was willing. The Holy Spirit will come on people whose hearts are totally yielded to the Lord, whatever, even if it's the ministry of suffering. And Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. Trouble's coming. 
And right now the Holy Spirit is falling all over the world in a great, great way upon peoples who, who, uh, who are being persecuted. The Holy Spirit came upon all those men dressed in, in, in orange on the beach as they were being executed. The Holy Spirit is falling upon mountain people in Iraq and Afghanistan and in Africa where they are being hunted down like dogs. The Holy Spirit is falling on them as they have the ministry of suffering. But the gospel is growing and growing and growing exponentially in, in Africa. Not quite as fast, but the gospel is getting in and growing in the Middle East because of the power of the Holy Spirit in the lives of these people that are being martyred. You can kill, you can kill Jesus, but you can't hold him back. You can't hold back his work. So Ananias comes to pray for him. He lays hands on him. And he says, uh, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So Paul had that second experience. So 120, the people in Samaria, Paul, and then in Acts chapter 10, in Acts is setting the pattern the template for what the church is supposed to be like and what the doctrine is supposed to be. Right? Somebody, I think it was, uh, what's the name of the fellow that, that, that carries the, the cross? Arthur Blessed. He said he came to, to a village and people got saved and he picked the one guy that could, that could read a little bit better and, and, and made him the pastor. And, and the new pastor said, well, what do I teach them? He said, well, just... Just look here in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Whatever it says, you say. And then look at the next book, the book of Acts, and whatever they did, you do. And then if you don't understand something, look at the rest of the New Testament, and it will explain it. So what it says, you say. What they did, you did. You do. So the book of Acts is the template that shows the pattern of the way the church is supposed to be. Together in one accord, fellowshipping with one another, having communion, praying for one another, suffering together, dying together. That's the template. And winning the world. It was said of the early church that those who have turned the world upside down have come here also. Run for the hills. And of course they've got it, they've got it wrong. Those who are turning the world right side up are the believers, the spirit-filled believers. So, so you have Paul, and then in, in chapter 10, you have Cornelius, uh, verse 14. Cornelius was a, was a centurion. He was the same rank as the, as the guy that was in charge of crucifying Christ. Who knows if Cornelius had been there? I don't know if he was there or not. I'm sure he heard about it, or he knew all about it. And he was a godly man. God heard his prayers. God accepted his faith. And he sent Peter to go and minister to him. And so in Acts chapter 10, verse 14, it says, while Peter was still speaking these words, talking to him, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision, that is the Jews who believed, were astonished as many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. So we weren't left out. It came to us also. And, and, and so you have another example of people who were saved and then under the ministry of the leadership of the church, the Holy Spirit came on them. And then we'll see what happens to them. Oftentimes when we talk about the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, uh, we, we go to, uh, where is it, First Corinthians, is it First Corinthians 12? Or where, where's the gifts? Where? I forgot Hey, I'm old, I forget stuff. And there's nine, right? We all talk about the nine gifts. Well, I find in the Bible there's way more than nine gifts. But I think those are just the example that is there. There's the gifts. I mean, for instance, when, when the, the uh, children of Israel came out of Egypt, they were like total slaves, didn't know anything except how to make bricks. 
out of uh, dirt and straw. But the Lord gave him the gift of, of music. They became musicians instantly. Gave him the gift of goldsmiths and silversmiths and, and working with wood. And, uh, these people had probably never held one of those instruments in their hand. But God gave them those gifts. And there's many gifts. There's many, 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 many gifts. Um, so I, I, what I'm going to say now, I, I don't necessarily classify it as uh, like the gifts, like the nine gifts. But, so let's call them manifestations. This is what happens when you receive the Holy Spirit. And this is how you know you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, been baptized in the Holy Spirit. The first thing that happens is boldness. Well, you want to call it the fruit or the result of, uh, of being filled with the Spirit. In Acts chapter 4, <clears throat> uh, again, Peter and John do a miracle in the name of the Lord, and uh, the, the leaders are all over their case. They, 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 they threaten them within an inch of their lives. That's pretty intimidating when the officials and all the guards and everybody take you, drug you, and put their, shake their, their, their finger in your face and tell you, do not speak anymore in the name of Jesus. I don't know what we would do. Maybe you've been told that at work. <laughs> not even that strong. That Bible on your desk. Uh, you know. And that's enough to intimidate us. Look in, in Acts chapter 4, verse 18. So they called them, that is the leaders called them, uh, Peter and John, called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, <laughs> they answered, whether, you judge, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to, listen to you more than to God. You tell me. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. When God does something miraculous and powerful and real in your life, you can't help it. You've got to tell it. If you're not telling it, there's something wrong with your teller. See? It's not working. So when they were further threatened, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people since all glorified God for what had been done. Look, look at verse 23. And being let go, once they, did, they went to their own companions, they went back to the church, and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God. They started praying. The whole church started praying. With one accord, and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David had said, why did the nations raise the people plot vain things, the kings of, you know, they, they go on talking about the greatness of God. Verse 29. Now, Lord, look at their threats. Look at the new laws that the legislature is passing. Look at how it has become politically incorrect to be a Christian. Look at how they threaten us with demotion or being fired. Look at the threats. And help us to hide. No, no, no. They said, and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. <laughs> They'd already been threatened within an inch of their lives. And instead of saying, oh man, I don't know what we're going to do. We're going to have to move, you know, look for another job, something. They said, no, we want more boldness. They had already talked back to the leaders and told them, we're going to obey God rather than you. Then they go back and pray and they want more boldness. Why, where did that boldness come from? Just a few days prior, they were hiding. They were afraid. Jesus had been crucified. It was all over. Uh, Peter gave up. They all gave up. Peter went back to his business of fishing. He, he, he just went back. But then when the Holy Spirit came on them, now they're bold. They, the, the very people who could kill them, 
They, the apostles, are, 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 are speaking right directly at them with courage and with boldness. You know that you have been filled with the Holy Spirit when you have, all of a sudden have that, that, that boldness. You're not afraid. What can they do? Kill you? It means you're in the presence of God soon. <laughs> That's all it means. Right? And when they had prayed, verse 31, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit again. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. So, not only is it a second experience, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but it is a continuing experience. How many times should you be filled? Every day. Every day. All day long. Many, many times. Uh, let, let me jump to, to my last verse. I don't know what. But in Ephesians uh, 5.18, it says, uh, Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, in, 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 in English, we have past, present, and future tense. In the Greek, I understand that there are, I'm not a grammarian, but, but I understand that there are several tenses, more than one. So it's hard to translate some stuff. If this was being translated literally, it would be, uh, not only be filled with the Spirit, but it would say, be being filled with the Spirit. Continually. It's like turn on the hose and leave it on. It's not just one time and take a drink. Remember on a hot day, you go over there. Ah, oh, that's good. No, leave it on. Leave it on. And continually, continually go back and be filled. So we need that over and over and over and over again. And as the days grow more like the last days, that power and that boldness of the Holy Spirit. They give another sign or manifestation or a result of being filled with the Spirit. This is why I say that the, the, the church is losing its power. Overall, the church in the United States, like I said, has diminished in the last 15 years. Even among Pentecostal denominations, only one has grown to any extent in the last 15 years overall. Yeah in the United States. One of the signs that we are a spirit-filled congregation, and that we are spirit-filled people, is that there is growth. These denominations that have grown grew when they were full of the spirit. Now that they're not seeking the Spirit. They're not, they don't even talk about the Spirit of God. They, they, they don't even seek to be filled again with the Spirit of God. They have lost their boldness, and they're not growing. We are growing. <laughs> oh, Acts chapter 5. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, Multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out to the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and all those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. In other words, there is a sick and tormented world out there that needs a source of healing and a source of power. They're looking to the church to bring the answer. The answer is Jesus Christ and under the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You don't have to be the pastor or the, or, or, or the leader in the church. Any old ordinary Christian can lay hands on somebody and pray for them because there are unclean spirits up there. That sniper this morning has <laughs> That has to be an unclean spirit that caused them to do that. Because the thief has come to steal, kill, and destroy. He's destroying his own soul. He's destroyed his life forever. Along with taking the lives of, of, of other people. One of the signs that the church is growing is uh, that the church is filled with the spirit. You know, people talk, we're a spirit-filled spirit -filled church. But I believe it when it starts to grow is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that draws people 
and I'll show you how. Uh, another, another sign of, of uh, being filled with the Spirit, and pick the, the, the one that, that applies to you. You need to grow and tell people about Christ and the Holy Spirit is talking to you about that. The next thing is that where there's a Spirit-filled congregation, where the Spirit of God is really moving, people are moved to service. In Acts chapter 6, and again, Acts is the temple, shows us how to organize the church and how the church should be. He said, therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer to the ministry of the Lord. You know that, that, uh, that God is answering your prayer and you are being filled with the Spirit when, when you begin to have a desire to serve in the kingdom of God. All too often, what I hear in, in, in churches and in the overall church of, of the Lord Jesus Christ is, is uh, pray for me because uh, a, a new promotion, because I want this, because I want that, and we're, we're thinking about a house. Where, uh, you know, it's all me, 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 me. Nothing wrong with it. We need to pray for those things because God needs to be in everything in our life. But what is lacking is that desire to serve, to serve in the kingdom of God. And there are multitudes of ways of, serve, of serving. Number one way is prayer. If you don't feel the need to, to, to serve with, with prayer by kneeling and, and praying for your pastor who is constantly under attack and praying for growth and praying for lost souls, you need to have a list in your Bible of people that, that are in your crosshairs, you're praying for them to be saved, come hell or high water, they're going to be saved, they're going to come to the Lord Jesus Christ, whatever it takes, because you're not leaving here without them. The number one service is prayer, because all other ministries are born out of prayer. If they're not born out of prayer, it, it, it's just human activity, which we see all too often. We see all too often, we, 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 we find that we're so blessed, I'm telling you, we're so blessed to have a, not a, a kid uh, uh, leading worship, but a man of God, a man of power, a man who has been there, who has done it, and, and knows God. I am sure that these songs mean something in his life throughout the week. And, and they, 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 they just burn his spirit so that when we come here and, and he leads us into what God is doing in his life. All too often, people flock to these big uh, productions and, and the worship is nothing more than a video production. They get the music from the videos and then everybody tries to copy the, 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 the video. And instead of hearing the horns and the, and the strings, and the, you, you just hear that lone guitar playing something. Only the person playing hears it in his mind because he can see the video. The rest of us can't. Just the video production, the worship. But when it is born out of a, of a servant's heart to serve, to lead, who feels the burden, who knows what, it, what's, what, what worship will do, we're so blessed. We're so blessed because what you're doing with these kids and teaching them. I, and when, I, when I played with them, I, I, their heart is there. They know what worship is about. It's not a video production. Praise God. Praise God. The church overall has lost the power of the Holy Spirit. How do I know that? Look at John chapter 16. Verse 8. And when he has come, that's he's talking about the Holy Spirit. When he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. When the Holy Spirit is present in the life of the church, the world is convicted. 
How do I know the church has lost its power? Because everywhere I go, I hear cussing. I hear vulgarities. Everybody uses it like, like, like it's normal. There's no fear of God. There's no conviction of sin. There's no conviction that they're going to be judged. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is absent or very weak in the life of the church. The problems with the rioting, the problems with, with, uh, with unemployment, the problems of, of, of sin of all kinds, the drug epidemic that, that we have in this country. You know who's to blame for all of that? The church. When the power of God is resident in you, wherever you go, people feel convicted whether they know or not. But it is. We need to be filled with the Spirit of God to speak with boldness and bring the kingdom of God wherever we step. The power of Jesus is there. The Holy Spirit convicts people. They'll say something untoward and, and they'll turn around, oh, I'm sorry, to start apologizing without even knowing who you are because of the Spirit that is within you. It just hurts my heart. I mean, it breaks my heart to, to hear people talk the way they talk. The movies have deteriorated. I mean, it, it, everything. The, and you can see, as the church has lost its power, sin has gained its strength. It's not lost. God, that doesn't mean God lost the battle. It just means that it's time for us to, to, to again uh, seek the Lord. And I think that there is a wave coming of a new revival, a new move of the Holy Spirit among people, ordinary people who are feeling hungry, who are sick and tired of, of what they see. And the answer is not necessarily, we, we need to vote, we, we need to be involved, we need to go to the meetings and all of that, that's part of, of being a citizen. But that's not the answer. The answer is that God, the Spirit of God, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. In God we trust? I don't think so. We don't trust in God anymore, not as a nation. There are a few, there is always a remnant, and that's all God needs. It only took 120 to turn the world upside down. 120 people out of millions. 120 people. You know that that uh, that uh, that we are spirit filled. That we that the spirit of God is in us when there is conviction, when there is growth, when there is a when there is a call to service. People want to to do stuff for the Lord, and when there is a spirit of conviction around you, and, and, and we will know there is revival. Revival is not necessarily when we will have more worship and more dancing and singing in church, but when people on the streets, the ordinary sinner out there, feels convicted because the glory of God is coming down. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. All of our denominations, including the four square, became great by very simple people. I mean, these people were uneducated. They didn't know hardly much. Most of them had never, had never gone to college. They just knew how to pray. They knew how to pray and seek God and preach with power, preach salvation, preach repentance, <laughs> and teach people to seek the Lord and be filled with the Spirit. And just ordinary people working in the factory, working in, 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 in agriculture, working in, in the city, bringing others to Christ. And my question is, do you want that? The other thing, the other way we know that, that the spiritual church, not only because there's growth, there's boldness, there's growth, there's service, there's conviction of, of sin, even in our own lives, in the life of the church. John chapter 16 goes on to say in verse 14, He will, the Holy Spirit, He will glorify me. He will glorify me. I don't know if those of you who have, who have been in ministry, if this ever happened to you. 
but I, even now I think about stuff and I want to vomit. How many times I did things. People thought, oh, what a wonderful ritual. Oh, that was wonderful. <coughs> and it was all me. <coughs> it was all me. It wasn't about the Lord. That's so sick. That's so sick. That's so wrong. It's not about us. It's about me. And him being glorified. The Spirit is here when we glorify him. But the music, the offering, the ushering, the setting up glorifies God. Our prayer life glorifies him. Our behavior at work glorifies Him. The way we talk to each other glorifies Christ. That is being spirit. Because we can't do it on our own. That's to be the power of God. Paul says, in me dwelleth no good thing. The psychologists tell you, there's a champion inside of you. You can be great. That's not true. You aren't good. There dwelleth well, no good thing. We're sinners by nature. It's only as we glorify Christ in our life and, and, and the Holy Spirit enables us that we are able to accomplish whatever it is that the Lord wants us to accomplish. Then we are more than conquerors. Then I can, I can do great things because of Christ who dwells in me. Glorify Christ. Can I, can I give you a, a slight review? Like, it's hard to preach and teach when people don't know the Bible. You know that the Holy Spirit is working in your life when the Bible starts becoming alive and you hunger after the Word of God. Again, still in John chapter 16, it says that He, the Holy Spirit, will guide you into all truth. And this is truth. The word is truth. You know, there's, there's a lot of sayings and a lot of, of philosophies in the world that are contrary to scripture. And we go along with them. I'm in love with him, but I'm in love with that other person. What should I do? And I told the kids, what's the advice? Follow your heart. What does the Bible say? The heart is desperately wicked. <laughs> Yeah, it, no, don't follow your heart. Follow the Lord. <laughs> oh, there's so many things, you know. Um, I, 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 really, I really have a, 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 a need. I'm going to start saving up. Well, well, it's good to save. We should. But that's not the secret of, of getting. What's the secret of getting? Giving. <laughs> if you have a need, if you have a need, a financial need, Start giving. <laughs> Give something special. Give something sacrificial. And God will honor His Word. Um, and, and the Word will reveal these truths to you because the world thinks upside down. They're backwards on just about everything. Everything. So whenever your first thought is this, you go, oh, wait a minute. What does the Scripture say? Run it through the filter of Scripture. Because the Bible, the Bible says that Jesus said that the the Holy Spirit will remind you. And he can't remind you if you don't know it. Okay? So you need to put it in. You need to know your Bible. I was, I was um, on Facebook. Yeah. Facebook. Uh, that's not good. Uh, I, I, uh, I was on Facebook and I saw, I saw a posting by someone who, who said, Pastor Ruben preached to such. And out of the two hours that I preached, or three hours that I preached, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> and he said, this is all they got out of the sermon. He said that if you don't know your Bible, you don't know anything. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. <laughs> that's true. You need, you need to know the Word. Someday, you may not be able to carry the Word. You need to have it in your heart. Uh, that's just a slight review. You know the Holy Spirit when you seek God. You want to get into the Word. You can't get enough of it. And it comes alive. It, 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 you know, like the stories in it that all of a sudden affect you and you learn from it and they inspire you or they convict you. 
th this is living. This is a living word. It's different from any other book. And lastly, no applause. Uh, lastly, the manifestation that is a spiritual church that we have been baptized in the Holy Spirit is that there is joy. There is joy. Uh, the scripture that I gave you earlier, Ephesians 5, 18 and 19, do not be drunk with wine in which there is dissipation, but be filled with spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart. There is joy. Because the Spirit glorifies Jesus. It brings him to the presence of God. brings him to the fullness of the presence of God. And the Bible says that in his presence is what? Fullness of joy. It is impossible to be depressed and defeated or downtrodden or give up when you are in the presence of God. Because in his presence is fullness of joy. That's the promise. No matter what is going on, you get into the presence of God. No matter how dark it is, no matter how serious the disease, no matter what the, the loss is, no matter what the, the defeat has been, or the obstacle, or the mountain, or the river, whatever you want to call it, you get in the presence of God and there is joy. There is joy. And the people of God who are filled with the Spirit of God should have those rivers of living water. Rivers of living water at all times. I promised I would tell you a famous story of Travis. So Travis is my five-year-old uh, friend that, that uh, never developed and was, was, uh, couldn't talk. He just made noises. And um, we became good friends. I invited him to my house. His dad brought him to my house. And, and I showed him all through the house. I showed him the pool. He was real happy. And, uh, I, loved, I loved Travis. And when I got the call to go to the hospital, uh, the pastor happened to be out of town, so I, uh, plus we were friends, and they called me anyway. And, and I went just as he was dying. And uh, that's when I sang to him, uh, Jesus loves me. And, and, and as, he, as I sang, he left me. And there was a sense of joy that came into the room. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. I don't know if you've ever been with, uh, with people as they, as they leave this world and they die. Uh, unfortunately, we wind up having to do a lot of that. And uh, I've been with several believers when they die. And it is like angels. I mean, it is the presence of God. It's glorious. I mean, you, you can almost feel it. <coughs> So I, I sang to, to, to Travis, and then uh, some days later, uh, we had the funeral service. I got to the church, and uh, they had asked me to say a few words about Travis. I got to the church, and the pastor grabbed me, and took me back, and he says, I'm not going out there. I said, but you're the pastor. He says, I'm not going out there. I said, why? He said, well, take a look. So I took the auditorium holds about 400. And, and uh, oh my goodness, all his friends, all his little friends who were turning were there. Everybody dressed in black. By the way, when I died, nobody dressed in black. <laughs> Everybody dressed in colors. The colors of heaven, the rainbow. Okay? And I've already left instructions with, with my family. I want they will tear up this place. They will tear it up with joyful music. Um, New Orleans will be more boring. Um, but I looked up and I looked up there. Oh, my, I've never seen such a sad thing. All the, the, the offering was full of terminally ill kids with their, with their uh, breathing apparatus, with their IVs in the wheelchairs. Some of them, you know, before. Oh, it was, it was terrible. And, and, it went, and the little coffin up at the front. Oh, and, and so I, I closed the door and I told him, I'm not going out there either. <laughs> Being God's man of faith and power, I said, I'm not going out there either. He said, well, you have to. I said, no, you're the pastor. He said, we 
no, but it was your friend. I said, no, so we're over there arguing. And, and he kind of opens the door. He's very strong. He pushed me out there. And so I go out there. And I go, hi! <laughs> and, and, and from one instant, I was so sad. I mean, I felt like lying down and just, just, I don't know, dying or something. It was so, it was more uh, sadness than, than a person can bear to see all those little kids. It's so sad. And with no hope, they're all terminal. In an instant, the Holy Spirit came on. In an instant, which the Lord would do. You know, when I pushed me out there, and I said, ah, you know, and, 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 and I started doing stand-up. You know, I started telling jokes. And, and the next thing, everybody's laughing about heaven, you know, and, and, and about Travis. And, and his dad is sitting right about where you are. And he had to hold himself. He almost fell out of the pew. He was laughing so hard. And the Spirit of God just came. A lot of the people didn't know what it was. But they just were happy. And there was joy as I talked to them about heaven. And, 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 and Travis probably leaping from one cloud to the other. And, and, and the Spirit of God came on me. So I went over to the piano. And I started singing, I'll fly away. I mean, we, we let it rip, man. We let it rip. I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly. I mean, just let, let it rip. And, and, and uh, I, play, I played it many times, many times. And, and, and people were starting clapping and the Spirit of God came. What's the difference between ordinary people and spirit-filled people? There is a joy because of the Holy Spirit that brings that strength and, and that joy in the worst of times. You're walking around, you know, like you lost your best friend. You need to go back, back to the beginning. <laughs> and uh, we're going to do that today. We're going to do that today. Um, I don't have any power, but uh, I know someone who does. And, and uh, if you need a touch, no, 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 not if. Everybody needs a touch of the Holy Spirit. Um, the, the Lord has started that. And uh, last week, I told you that, uh, that uh, I didn't realize I hadn't spoken for two hours. And, but the kids were interested. I mean, they were on the edge of their seat. They were asking questions. And, and they were all, I've never been interrupted so much in my life trying to preach him in Geneva over here. So it was Robbie this morning, you know, but, but the Lord was, was in it. And it was glorious. And, and when they came back, they wanted to be prayed for. And we prayed for them. And prayed. About three and a half hours into it, I, I, I'm old. You know, and and I, was, I was out of I, I couldn't, I couldn't stand anymore. I, would, I, I, I couldn't even play anymore. I was so tired. And, and uh, Janine says, um, you want to go lie down? I said, yeah. I started to walk away. <laughs> I started to walk away. And she grabs me. And she says, no, not yet. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. Yeah. And then the, the Holy Spirit came on her. She grabbed me. I couldn't even stand anymore. She grabbed me, and somehow she, I mean, I, I, I weigh more than 100 pounds, you know, I, I have a few pounds on me. She dragged me over there, and with the other chair, she, with the other hand, she brought a chair, and she sat me down, and she was praying, and I, you know, I put my hands up, because the Spirit was, was, was there, you know? And uh, how many of you know you can't say no to uh, Ask her no that you can't say no to this. Especially when she's anointed. Oh man, the power of God is there. I, we used to hardly stand when some of the kids were standing but they felt like they were drunk. They went drunk with wine. They had never experienced it. They didn't know what that was. It is the Spirit of God. And I am praying for that right now, this morning, today, as Rick uh, comes up to lead in worship. I'm going to go over there, and, uh, and I'm going to ask the, the, the kids that went to camp to stand behind me, and I'm going to pray for you. Uh, we're going to lay hands, Pastor, we're going to lay hands on people as they come up, that they be filled with the Holy Spirit, or be refilled with the Holy Spirit, be touched by the power of God. So, uh, Ricky, just do whatever you need to do, and I'm going to walk over there and ask the kids that went to camp to stand behind me, and then everybody else just come by. God is calling you. This message was for you. It's not if you want to. 
you need it. You need it. You need it, and God is here to touch you. So whenever you're ready, you just you just start. Oh, you need more. The rest of your singers. Oh, okay. All right. The rest, the rest of you singers, come on up because he, he needs to have some backup. Don't just look at me. Start moving. Like they used to walk over there where Miss Janine is, and everybody else start lining up on the coming. And we're going to pray for you, Pastor. So we can pray for people and lay hands on them. We have no power. But the Holy Spirit will touch you. And if you need to repent and accept Jesus as your Savior, you just uh, tell the pastor so he can pray with you. Okay? And we can cut it right there. We can cut it right there.
feel the wheels touch the ground, the pilot powered back up, and all of a sudden we were shooting right back up into the sky. Now it happened to me once before on Delta. It's happened twice on Delta. It happened to me once before on Delta when we were flying into Dallas. And, and that time they, they came on and they said, oh, sorry, we there's such a lot. Excuse me. Uh, we weren't done with the movie, so we wanted to get you, let you have the movie. Right? So they're going to waste all this fuel on that. But, but this yesterday when we were coming in and, and all of a sudden he powers right back up and shoots back up in the sky. And I looked at Janine and I said, he either missed the runway or there was a plane on the, on the runway. And so we get back up over the ocean and we're climbing again. He comes back on and he says, you know, I apologize for that. There was a plane on the runway that wasn't getting off. And, and really what he was saying is, if I would have landed, we'd all be dead. And I feel like right now today there are people that are on your plane when you're approaching your runway. And if you continue down the path that you've been on, you will be dead. And I'm not talking physically, I'm talking spiritually. Maybe right now you have an option, you have a decision. Are you going to land, are you going to allow to continue on your crash course that's destined for death and destruction? Or are you going to power up right now? And are you going to get that second chance at that landing? We, we, we turned around, we came back, and we landed beautifully. But, but there are people here today, I believe, that are at that, are at that moment right now in their life. And the question is, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to ignore the signs? Are you going to ignore the voice of the Holy Spirit and the nudging and the conviction? Or are you right now going to power your plane back up and are you going to go around for a second chance? I fully believe that we received a second chance on that plane yesterday. And I believe there are people here right now that the Holy Spirit wants to give that second chance to right now. And don't worry, God doesn't give me names or anything, so I'm like, oh Lord, please not me. But if, if what I'm seeing is making sense to you, if what I'm saying is nudging, then I encourage you to come over right now. Isn't this beautiful? Look at these kids. These kids are praying. These kids are praying right now. They're praying for you. That's what last week I did for them. If your plan, if your plan is headed for that runway, you have no idea what's going to happen when you did. I want you to come over. If you do not know Jesus as your Savior, now is the chance. Now is your time. The flight out to the East Coast, we were, that plane was continuing on to Paris, France. And when the terrorist attack happened in France, Janine said, we may have seen people on that plane that ended up in that disaster church. We don't know what's going to happen. That's why the Bible says don't count your, don't count your life in years, count, count in days. And I actually encourage people to count in minutes. If you don't know where you are right now, if you don't know where you're going right now, I encourage you to come over here. And let us pray for you. This isn't a statistic. This isn't a number. We're not going to, you know, praise God. We had 20 people saved this month. No, this is about God's healing. This is about eternity. God is offering you your second chance right now. So I encourage you, and I apologize, Rick, if you get to just play a little bit longer. I encourage you to come over to let us pray. I want to know. I want to know that we are a church of safety. I want to know that we are a church filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and with His presence. I want to know that when any of us walk into a room, that room is going to be different and better because the Holy Spirit working through us. So I invite you over. Rick, when you guys are done, you can end. Join us for coffee and donuts. But I believe, I believe, I believe in my heart there is someone who is someone right now. And if they land, it's not Please come, let us pray. We hope that you've enjoyed today's podcast. Journey of Faith is a Foursquare Christian church located in Glendora, California. For more information on Journey of Faith, visit us on the internet at www.thejourneyoffaith.net. That's www.thejourneyoffaith.net. You may also call us at 626-914-3400. And finally, we hope you will come visit us. Our Sunday morning service is at 10 a.m. We offer ministries for all ages, from newborns through high school during our service. May God bless you. Thank you for joining the journey.